Today I'm going to show you how to add just a little bit of polish to your game using a variation of effects like a simple run particle system, a shockwave effect, a dust cloud when you hit the ground, and using object pulling to make a ghost particle effect when you dash. Let's begin. Shall we play a game? As we get started with this build, I just want to say that I wanted to stay away from instantiating and destroying objects as much as possible, which is typically what people do with particle systems. And the reason why is when you're making games for a mobile system or a mobile device, for example, Android or iPhone or tablets or something of that caliber, you want to try to conserve memory as much as possible. Because with games on mobile devices, every little bit of CPU and memory usage is extremely valuable. So each one of these particle systems tries to avoid that as much as possible and surely throughout this build you'll see exactly what I mean. I am serious, and don't call me Shirley. Okay, first of all, let me just say that I'm not trying to be lazy, I just don't see any point in making a how-to video on how to make a particle system since there's already a plethora of information on YouTube. Uh, just go to YouTube, type in Particle Effect Unity, and these videos right here will give you exactly what you need on making particle effects, so they explain them much better than I could. Um, and I don't want to take credit for, for their work, I want to show you how to call these particle effects in Unity without code using Bolt Visual Script. Okay, let's get started. For this first particle system, I'm going to be working on the run particle, and I actually built this by watching the dust effect when running and jumping in Unity particle effect video by Press Start, so I will put a link in the description below for that. Um, what you're going to need for this build is you're going to need a run PS macro. So let me go ahead and throw that up on the screen. Just go ahead and build this, pause the screen, and we'll continue when you're ready. Once you get your particle system ready, um, it should look something like this for the run particle. Um, and I just drug it into my folder here and made a prefab out of it. Um, and I childed it underneath the player and I gave it the tag run particle. So if you don't have run particle, just add the tag. Uh, just add another one in there, call it run particle, and make sure that you assign the appropriate tag to that game object. So again, just child that under your player and position it at its feet. And while it's running, it should look something like that. Once you get that set up and ready to go, just go down to the bottom of your run particle game object and go ahead and give it a flow machine and put that run particle system flow macro or run PS flow macro on that game object. And just when you get it done, just make sure you go over here to override and uh, apply all at the very top in the inspector screen. If you have been following along in this player controller tutorial series, then you should have a non-combat mode with a master macro under your player where the fixed uh, update is checking for the sprint function. And um, this is what the sprint function used to look like. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be adding on to this just a little bit. We're going to be breaking the system right here after the set animator bool and just moving the output over. And then we're going to put in uh, this system right here. What this is essentially doing is it's checking to make sure that our player is sprinting. If he's sprinted, if he's grounded, and if he's moving, then it's going to press play on our particle system. Again, it's not instantiating or destroying anything. It's already there. It's just playing it versus stopping it. So if those things aren't true, then it will stop it. So just go back into our particle system, show exactly how this is working. When run PS is triggered, which is going to be grounded, sprinting, and moving all at the same time, then it will play the particle system and if any of those things are not true, if it's in the air, or if it's not moving, or if it's not sprinting, then it will stop PS custom event, and it will just stop the particle system. Once you get all that set, you should now have a particle system that only plays while you're sprinted, grounded, and moving all at the same time. So if you're in the air, you shouldn't see that particle effect follow you around in the air. It should only happen when those three parameters are true on the ground. For this next particle effect, I just reused an old particle effect that I had had and got from this guy's video. Um, I'm not even going to try to pronounce his name because that one just throws me, but it's uh, Ripple Effects and uh, this is a very helpful video as far as setting up the particle effect that I used. It's called Shockwave Brown and it looks just like that. It's very simple, not complicated at all. On this Shockwave Brown, I did go ahead and put a flow machine on it called Particle Destroy. So you're going to need to go ahead and build that. Uh, start event is a coroutine. It just essentially waits one second and destroys itself. Yes, I know that I am 
breaking my rule of instantiating and destroying objects, but the reason why I'm doing it here is because it's just one particle effect that you can call every once in a while when you dash. It's not really using that much CPU usage or memory. Um, so where you're actually going to fix that is going into your player non-combat. Uh, this is what the old dash used to look like. And this is where we're going to actually be breaking that. So right after the move variable force, just break both of these fields, scoot everything over to the right just a little bit, and throw this instantiate shockwave um, uh, function in right here, and then just drop your shockwave brown right into that game object right there. So now, whenever you dash, you should see that you have a dash effect, and um, it should look something like that. For this next particle effect, we're going to focus on how to make a landing dust happen whenever you hit the ground. The way that we're going to do that is just right click, create an empty object, name it landing smoke, uh, give it the land dust tag, so create a new tag in there, call it land dust. Uh, you're going to give this one an animator, and we're going to create a couple of animations for this. Um, under the sprite, it is going to have a sprite render over because this is not actually a... Um, a, a particle effect so to speak it's it's more of an animation so it's a nine uh, nine frame animation that looks like this so this is just another way to do a different kind of particle effect and I have it set to 60 on the sample so that it's really really quick but you're gonna be doing set up an idle animation and one called landing smoke an idle is basically blank there's nothing in it so uh, as you come into entry this is going to be childed under our player game object and you just kind of kind of move it down to the player's feet so that uh, whenever this plays that's where it's going to come out so wherever the player moves it'll move um, so basically what I'm doing there is I have a parameter set up for land uh, which is just a trigger and so whenever it triggers it's going to uh, go into my landing smoke um, game object here and I'm just gonna rename this play that will be a lot uh, more helpful for me to say okay well there's idle or stop so just name that one stop and uh, the other one play um, and uh, the way that we transition this is that we have a land trigger condition uh, this has no exit, exit time going from stop to play um, it is uh, going to be set to zero on the transition duration uh, again that's the only condition and there is no condition going back but it does have an ex exit time of one with zero transition so make sure that it is set up something like this and i'll show you how to set this up in bold if you've been following the series from the beginning that you remember in video three that we gave our player a game object called feet position that's childed underneath it that has a box glider 2d with um, a trigger set on it that looks just like that that basically whenever this comes in collision with a platform that it's going to return a grounded variable that should look something like that so um, at the end of that inner uh, collision then what we're going to do is we're going to add this right here and what this is a once unit that basically every time that comes through after the first time that we're going to find the game object land dust and we're going to set that trigger land to true the reason why you're doing that is because when you start the game this actually enters that collision and we want it to do it every time except for the first time and when you get it done it should look something just like that. Okay, this last system is kind of like a ghost particle effect uh, whenever the player dashes, which is not actually a particle effect at all. It's more of an instantiation of game objects in where the player is located at that moment, and it fades over time that you can have control over how many of those things uh, instantiate and um, how long it takes for them to fade over time. So that's completely customizable and it's completely up to you if you don't want it to be uh, the blue color, you can change it to something else, to something more of your liking. But in order to get away from the uh, instantiation and destroying of game objects, which as I've said, uh, uses a lot of CPU and memory, um, what we're going to do is we're going to make use of One Wheel Studio's uh, object pooling system. So if you've not watched that, I would highly encourage you to do that. There is a link to that in the description below. Okay, this one is significantly more complex, and because of that, you're going to need several new macros, as well as a scene variable and two new prefabs. So, let me show you what these are. You're going to need the function call macro from One Wheel Studio, the function event macro, the function return macro, and the object pool macro from One Wheel Studio's object pooling series. You're also going to need the object manager macro, the color alert macro, the player ghost macro, 
and the spawn PG or spawn player ghost macro. When you get all these set up, you're going to need to create a new object. So go right click in the hierarchy, create an empty object, name that player ghost, and then just drag it down in here into your folder to create a prefab from it and you can delete it out of the hierarchy. So once you get that made, what you're going to need is a sprite renderer on that. You can set that to any sprite for your player that you want. I just set mine to Adventure Idle. It's not going to matter since it's going to be copying the, Mac, uh, the, uh, the sprite on that game object whenever it's moving through the air or wherever you have it moving. Um, you're also going to need a flow machine on that called Player Ghost. That's where you're going to drop that one. And um, let me just basically explain how this is working. Um, on enable events, so whenever this thing gets enabled, uh, which whenever you create or instantiate an object, it also gets enabled at the same time. But whenever you enable it from being disabled later on, it's going to uh, set the graph variable fade time to 0.1. You can set that to whatever you want. The, the higher the number, the longer it's going to take for that game object to fade. I'll give you a demonstration of that in just a second. What it does is it, it sets the sprite for that game object to whatever the sprite is on your player. So it's going to get the scale, it's gonna get the position, and it's going to set that game object in that one location. And it's going to do this several times over an update event. Now, as this thing is uh, being instantiated and updated, it's also going to change the color of it, which I have mine initially set to like a, a light blue. And then I have the uh, alpha turned all the way down. So that color alert, uh, basically what this is doing is it's just taking color A and it's turning it into color B over time which the duration is going to be your fade time and it's going to do that on the sprite. So what that's doing setting the color over time to the fade time and as it uh, continues for that after it's done it's going to return that ghost so type in a custom trigger. Uh, custom event trigger type in return ghost and it's going to return that to the object manager in the scene so what you're going to need to do also is add a new scene variable here and uh, you're first actually going to have to make the object manager so we'll come back to that in just a second so our object manager is going to just be an empty object with a flow machine on it give it the object manager flow macro and basically what this is doing is this is now you can drag in the player ghost to this game object here and this is going to instantiate this game object from the pool and return it to the pool once it's done. So uh, I'm not going to try to explain One Wheel Studios um, object pooling. He does a great job in that. So if you need help with uh, understanding how that one works, go watch that video. Once you get that set, you're going to be able to make a game object in the scene variables. So just go to your variables window and click the plus sign down at the bottom. Add a new game object and just drag in your object manager right there and drop it. Now how you're going to get this to instantiate over time is uh, going to my player uh, under the dash function. I'm going to set an update. Uh, and I'm going to just after I drop an update, I'm going to do that spawn PG or spawn player ghost macro and just set it right here. Now all this is doing is it's, it's setting it every 0.3 seconds. So uh, and then it's it's calling that unit from the object manager, which is going to be instantiating and destroying uh, or I'm sorry, repooling those objects back in the list. So I'll show you exactly how that works in the hierarchy. Let me kill this guy real quick. So uh, what you're going to do is when you dash, you notice that it sets those game objects. And notice that it only spawned four clones. So it might actually spawn a new one here, just depending on how many it goes through in a second. So the second time you notice, it's just enabling and disabling each one of these as it goes. So you can actually do this more often. You can, so I set this to a lower number here. And I it's, notice it's grabbing a whole bunch more of those. And so because it's grabbing more, it's creating them, and then it is putting them back. And it shouldn't create any more because now um, it's got everything that it needs in the object pooling. This is significantly less on your memory and CPU usage, uh, and the, just the first time it's set, and then it's set forever. Uh, again, I don't want mine to come come out that that much, so I'm going to set mine to 0 0.03 
and uh, it's going to set it a lot less frequently. So going back to um, my player game object here, player ghost, if I wanted to set the color to be something different, let's say for example I didn't want, I don't know, I didn't want that, that uh, particular color, I wanted something red, well then I would go over here and set the alpha back down to zero. Uh, and it, this is this is highly customizable. You can just change it to whatever color that you want. All right, you should now not only know how to create multiple particle type effects on your player. You've been following this series from the beginning. This is the last video in the series, and you should now have a completed player controller. Now, if you have been following this from the start, would you do me a favor and let me know in the description of this video? I'm really curious if doing multiple parts in a series on a player controller is something that the community is actually looking for, or if I should just stick to just one-shot videos. Anyway, I hope you get some use out of this, and at the very least, I hope you have discovered that you can make games without code. I'm looking forward to my next project, and I hope to see you there. As always, my name is Megahertz, and I'm out.